Good afternoon and welcome to the second part of our annual general meeting. The first thing I'd like to tell all our members and partners is that the business is stable and is in the process of securing its medium term future. We face ongoing challenges that may obstruct our progress and alter our timeframes, but ultimately Scottish Rugby was a strong business going into this pandemic and will be a strong business when we come out of the crisis. In normal circumstances, I will give a presentation to stakeholders which outlines the significant events of the last 12 months, examines the performance of our international and professional teams, and looks at the community game. I'd also touch on the union's finances. But as we're all too painfully aware, these are not normal circumstances. So my presentation today will take a different path. I'll talk about an 18 month period instead of a season long timeline. I will also focus much more on our financial position and the outlook a lot across the next 12 months. We have covered a good deal of background regarding the activities of Scottish Rugby in the annual review that you received a week ago. I encourage you all to take a good look at this document as it captures a huge amount of detailed information about our sport and its people. So then back to today. We've been dealing with the impact of COVID-19 on our business and forecasted implications going forward. I understand the concerns of clubs across the country regarding the lasting effect of the pandemic on the community game. And we share those concerns and your council, along with rugby development colleagues, are working incredibly hard to ensure that whatever route or timescale we finally achieve within government rest restrictions, clubs will be supported and guided through the transition. I know opinion was finally divided between clubs wanting to play and train despite the restrictions and others who wanted some surety about the near-term future, needing to make plans that allowed them to sustainably deal with the crisis. In the end, and after a huge amount of discussion and heart searching, the board, on the council's recommendation, reluctantly cancelled the competitive adult season. As your president stated, it was a difficult decision, but it was the right decision, and it was one that was supported by government. I think this neatly illustrates how our structure works and how finely balanced some of our decisions are. Often, there's been no good answer, only the least worst option. As we move into 2021, we need to reflect on the work that's taken place to protect the union from the worst effects of COVID-19 and establish just what the next 12 months could look like from a playing and financial point of view. I know you all understand that our first priority must be to protect the game in Scotland. And the very first action we took was to set up a club hardship fund with half a million pounds to help clubs deal with the early effects of the crisis. This was well received and allowed clubs to navigate their way through the summer. Our next step was to create a threat management group, a multidiscipline body through which we assessed the impact of the pandemic and collated our company-wide response to clubs, government and the wider world. It became very clear early in the pandemic that our only prospect of getting players on the pitch was in the professional game. The control and expertise required to create an environment to safely play the game could only have been undertaken in a professional context where we employ the players and support staff and have the necessary capability to comply with government regulation. There was absolutely no possibility of that being replicated or being affordable for amateur clubs across the country. Additionally, given 80% of our revenue comes from the international and professional game, we focused our resources on restarting professional rugby in order for us and each of our union partners to protect broadcast and sponsorship income. We had contracts to complete and obligations to fulfil. The creation of the Autumn Nations Cup was in response to the need to create international fixtures to replace the matches against Sanzar countries, which were impossible to stage because of the travel restrictions. Throughout the coronavirus period, we have shared as much information with our clubs and stakeholders as often as possible and in detail around returning to clubhouses and training. I thank clubs across the country for their establishment of COVID coordinators, of which we now have 171 across the nation. And I want to thank all our clubs for the responsible way they've managed themselves throughout the pandemic. I want to use today's opportunity to explain just where we are in the plan to deal with the impact of COVID-19 on our organisation, explain why the accounts for this year are being published later than normal, talk through the effect of the income generated from CVC becoming a partner in Pro 14, and the effect this has had on our financial position and reporting. The primary task 
was to deal with the unprecedented drop in income created by the pandemic. Essentially, since March of this year, we've been able to take advantage of the major income streams that fund the union. Without matches to play or spectators, we can't sell tickets, maximise sponsorship revenue or exploit hospitality income. Fortunately, we were able to conclude our two home fixtures in this year's Six Nations tournament, and that was extremely helpful. The loss of income was so instant and so dramatic that we had to begin to reassess our whole operating structure. So we created a four-point plan to deal with the pandemic's effect on the union. Part one was respond, part two, reset, part three, rebuild, and part four, recover. In responding to the crisis, we talked extensively to our people, players and coaches. It's vitally important that our people know the scale of the challenge and their role in helping the business come to terms with the enforced change. Our people agreed to take a salary cut initially for a five month period from April to September and then again to extend that out until June 2021. We protected our lowest paid colleagues introducing a sliding scale of sacrifice based on salary levels. We also began conversation with the Players Association in Scotland, RPS, and we explained the straightened situation, our uncertainty around timescales, and the long-term impact on the professional game. What followed was a mature, professional, and collaborative discussion in which both sides shared their concerns, but also understood that this was a union-wide problem which affected off-field colleagues and the whole of the community game as well. I want to sincerely thank all our people, our players, coaches and RPS for their continued support and collaboration. We were generally as one in this crisis. In Scottish rugby, like so many other unions, activity drives cost. Programmes to develop community rugby, age grade players, academy talent, coaching pathways and education all drive cost. Our stakeholders expect us to deliver these programmes and as we were able to fund more of these activities, the cost and number of players and coaches involved rises sharply. COVID-19 stopped these activities in their tracks and moreover, effectively, closed the community game at the same time. We have therefore been able to save a considerable amount of money through the postponement of these programmes, and when we come back to a point when they can be restarted, we may choose to reassess our approach. The salary savings I referred to earlier also contribute greatly to our cost control programme. The government's job retention scheme, in its first iteration and its second, has offered us a lifeline that we've used to great effect. A large proportion of our workforce have at one time or another been on furlough. This has put increased strain on some of the people that have worked through the pandemic, but has been necessary for the organisation to keep itself protected. Any discretionary spend was removed and all expenditure has to be pre-approved, justified and then sanctioned centrally. And this is the type of business practice that you'll have been taking in clubs across the nation and you'd expect us to do the same. We've harvested around £40 million of savings, which have gone a long way to offsetting the £18 million hole in our expected income for 2021. And this was all part of our four-point plan. But part one, Respond, didn't simply focus on cost savings from operational management. It went further and examined three ongoing options based upon the best business intelligence that was presented at the time. Option one looked at the worst case scenario presented at the time, which was no rugby at all in season 2021, internationally, professionally, or at community level. Option two looked at no rugby at all until January 21. No ticket or broadcasting income for the autumn matches, a high risk scenario where a partial return to rugby with reduced attendance and some reduced sponsorship income. Option three, look to professional rugby returning behind closed doors from autumn 2020 and social distancing measures affecting match attendances for the Six Nations in 2021. The board chose to adopt option three because it was the most likely option to take place given the government's posture at the time and the capability that we knew we could muster to enable professional players to play safely from a health and welfare perspective. To this point, our decision to choose option three has been justified. We explained to all our people that if option three were to be adopted as our budget position for the 2021 financial year, and if it were to be achieved, there would be no need for redundancies. However, if the situation migrated to option two and then further to option one, 
then we would need to revisit this position and almost certainly redundancies would be necessary. We have around 450 employees, of which around 158 are players. When compared to other home unions, we are of comparable size and capability when the adjustments are made for the ownership and outsourcing of professional players. We believe this to be an appropriate headcount to allow us to operate and function at an internationally competitive level. Given the fact that our future success will be dictated by how quickly we can return our revenues back to pre-COVID-19 levels, retaining the people in the organisation who can achieve that is vital to any bounce back. We also need to keep the rugby expertise we have to get the nation back to playing rugby safely and swiftly once the restrictions on play are lifted. Therefore, any changes to the shape and eventual size of our organisation post-COVID-19 should be made on an informed and strategic basis rather than a linear calculation that strips out costs more bluntly, leaving the business unable to be as flexible and nimble as it needs to be to return to health. We are now in part two of the four-point plan, Reset. This sees the organisation look at how the business might be shaped for a post-COVID-19 world. It also reaffirms our business model, evidencing that the professional teams are the catalyst for a successful, sustainable and competitive national team that generates the vast proportion of our income. And from this pool of generated income comes a total funding of our community game. I'd like to take the opportunity to explain to you why the accounts for 1920 will be published later than usual. There are a variety of reasons, the most important of which is the need to offer our stakeholders the most accurate and up-to-date picture we have on our financial situation as we deal with the ongoing effects of coronavirus. Much like organisations across the country right now, auditors are required to look for as much certainty as possible in the 12 months ahead. For Scottish Rugby, a critical element of our revenue results from match day attendances, which when set against a backdrop of ongoing government restrictions and an ever-changing sporting landscape, this has made financial forward planning challenging and unpredictable. Therefore, we've taken the time to ensure we could present the most up-to-date projections and related support from the bank to satisfy the auditor's review of our financial year ahead. Our original time horizon took us to the end of the current financial year. As the virus has re-emerged and economic outlook has begun to look more uncertain, PwC have needed to test our assumptions and look beyond this current year through to the beginning of 2022. And this is happening across the UK in all kinds of businesses. We are in the sport and hospitality sector and as such are seen as being more affected than other enterprises. The length of the outlook period and the need to allow for a serious plausible downside risk has resulted in us restructuring our finances with the bank. And I'm delighted to say that we're about to conclude an arrangement with them that delivers flexibility for the union and satisfies these heightened expectations. This process takes time and a certain amount of patience, especially in the current business climate. But I'm pleased that our forecasts have been subject to rigorous examination and challenge because it's resulted in us negotiating a bank facility which offers the game a level of security that you, our members, would expect and places us in a better position to cope should these downtide risks materialise. To properly understand and gauge our financial position, it would be easier to take a two-year overview to assess the damage COVID-19 will have on our business. Instead, we have to describe the impact in 2019-2020 through the accounts and forecast the continuing effects of the virus for the next 12 months. We were trading very strongly through the 1920 financial year up and until the virus struck. In 2018-19, our turnover reached £61 million. Pounds. In 2019-2020, we were scheduled to deliver around £59 million pounds of turnover, which was down on the year before, but was nevertheless a record for a Rugby World Cup year. The negative effects of the revenue fall between February and May reduced our expected turnover from £59 million pounds to approximately £55.47 million. Pounds. Our expenditure for the 1920 year came in at around £60.74 million. Pounds. Now you'd normally expect to see that evidence in the accounts as a headline statistic showing an operating loss of £5.27 million. Pounds. 
The audited figures for 1920 actually show that the business recorded a surplus before interest and tax of £3.11 million. Pounds. Now, this is entirely because part of the proceeds of CBC's investment in Pro 14 landed in the 1920 financial year. So, our audited financial outturn looks as follows. Income, £55.47 million. Pounds. Expenditure, £60.74 million. Pounds. An operating loss of £5.27 million. Pounds. An inclusion of Pro 14 proceeds of £8.38 million. Pounds. The surplus before interest and tax was therefore £3.11 million. Pounds. And the surplus after interest and tax was £2.87 million. Pounds. Our financial statement, which will follow AGM2, will describe the 1920 outcomes in some depth and offer plenty of time for questions from clubs ahead of AGM3. Since the year end, we've also received a second payment of Pro 14 proceeds, which will positively impact the results from this current financial year, 2021, helping to offset a serious and sustained drop in income. Despite this welcome injection of cash, we still expect the 2021 financial year will show a significant financial loss. The initial proceeds of the Pro 14 investment have been retained within the business to provide the financial security which allows us to trade through the worst effects of the pandemic. It's important though to explore the short-term impact the virus has had on our business. Our estimate of a shortfall in revenue remains at around £80 million to May 2021. The news from government is, as you're aware, subject to sudden and material change. Therefore, we have to be clear about any effect on the union of a more sustained and aggressive shutdown. As I mentioned, our auditor PwC asked us to look at a plausible severe downside in any projections we submitted to them running through to 2022. This was calculated and it resulted in a further forecasted fall in income of £12 million. And this model assumed there'd be no crowds at any of the 2021 Six Nations matches or any home games for Glasgow and Edinburgh. There would also be a consequential drop in sponsorship revenues. In addition to this, the downside case went further, asking us to suppress revenues from the 2021 Autumn International Series by 75%. This more extreme scenario would see a fall of over £30 million in turnover and would need to be covered with a reframed bank facility. We have made public statements about our inability to continue in our current form if losses of this size did not result in some form of de direct government support. All of the home unions and other sports find themselves in very similar territory. We have been in lockstep with the Scottish Government and have been in regular dialogue with the UK Government as this crisis has unfolded. Our belief in government support has been evidenced by the emergency support delivered in recent days through DCMS. Rugby in England received a significant support package acknowledging the impact COVID-19 has had on the game at all levels. We in Scotland are waiting to hear the details of the Scottish Government's support plan. Wales are also unclear about the support they will receive. But we expect that the combination of our revised banking arrangements and a material support package from the government should go some way to repairing our finances and allowing the game in Scotland to return to health. So in summary therefore, we're managing to trade as planned, working to our option three budget. If we continue on the current path, we hope to have reduced crowds at international games and professional team matches, but our community season structure has had to be postponed in light of the public health and safety restrictions required for a meaningful season to be completed. Currently there are some positive signs. Following the tightening of restrictions across the UK, there seems to be more confidence around an eventual decline in the rate of infection. Our business has endured a huge shock that will be mitigated through a tight cost control programme, a package of government support and the vital proceeds of the Pro 14 agreement with CVC and the support of our lenders. The Pro 14 monies were generated from an asset that up until a year ago was deemed worthless. Crystallising the value of the tournament has transformed Celtic Union revenues and formed a foundation for a credit solution from the bank. And we hope to be able to announce further reassurance before January through the signing of a Six Nations deal again with CBC. And we hope that this will future-proof the union for years to come 
providing a sustainable and long-term provision for the community game and our stakeholders. Now I understand that the last few months have been incredibly difficult for everybody involved in our game. We have lost almost 18 months of community rugby and that will have a lasting effect on the fabric of our sport. But we need to pull together, finding solutions to our problems at all levels of the game. And in the face of these challenges, your board and council are working tirelessly to provide a stable financial platform whilst encouraging the game to be played at all levels safely and securely. We face the greatest challenge to our organisation for decades, but I assure you that Scottish Rugby is doing everything it can to meet this challenge and protect clubs, players, coaches, volunteers and all our people at BT Murrayfield and Scotston. Thank you.